بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم All praises are Allah's Lord of the worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon our master the holy prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate Ahlul Bayt Concerning the question that brother Rahal asked the nafsul mutma'inna is used in the feminine sense here the spirit is one the I is one this I depending on how it acts in this world it acquires a number of different states if the eye decides to sin predominantly it's called the nafsul ammara not that it's a separate soul it's a status quo of the eye as a result of its actions if the eye sins in this world and then regrets it and reproaches itself it's called the nafsul lawama it's not another soul it's of a higher degree it actually reproaches itself after sinning and then there's a status of this soul where one becomes mukhlas not mukhlas but mukhlas now and then we call the eye as having reached a state and that state being referred to as nafsul mutmainna so these are states states of that one I that we are which I was saying is sexless but in Arabic sometimes to these states they use the literal masculine term or the feminine term in this in this case this status of the soul the nafs is the literal feminine um, gender is used but not that it's a separate being or it's separate to that I the I is something else depend, depending on how it acts in this world there a different number of states arise and that's what we get it so it's not referring to an I it's referring to a status quo which in Arabic this nafs is regarded the status quo of the I is used in the feminine literal sense not in the feminine real sense as if it's a woman or something okay it was a good question though I never paid attention to that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim the dispositions the spiritual status quo the ethics the mental constitution, the bodily constitution, all these of the parents play a significant role in the spiritual status and ethics and temperament of the offspring. The dispositions of the parents, the bodily, the mental, the spiritual constitution of the parents how the parent thinks how the parent behaves how the parent treats one's neighbors one's family all these play a significant role in the bodily and spiritual status quo of the offspring that's one point one step higher the dispositions, the spiritual status, the bodily constitution, the ethics of one's grandparents, great-grandparents, and keep on going higher. They all have an effect and a role in relation to the offspring one day. One step higher, even the intentions of the parents the way they think has an effect on the embryo 
or the intentions of the grand, the great grandparents, and so on and so forth, has an effect on the succeeding embryo which is going to be born one day in the future. Even the way the parents think, the way they behave, will have an effect at the time of conception. Also, the way the parents think, the way they act, the way they earn during the nine months of gestation, and so on and so forth. So from preceding generations to before conception, to at conception, after conception, there's a thousand and one different parameters at play which contribute to the bodily and spiritual constitution of the offspring. And this can be extracted from the logic of the traditions from the Ahlul Bayt. Why is this important? Because a significant amount of our destiny is in the hands of those who preceded us. This responsibility <coughs> in relation to the preceding generations. They're responsible to some degree in relation to our destiny. Every act one does right now, whether you're eating, speaking, listening, from moment to moment, every act you do, every intention you have, the way you think, the way you talk, and everything right now has some influence and some role in the development of your succeeding offspring. It may be one generation away, two generations away, it may be 50 generations away. The potential is there. When it comes to the physical or medical realm, it's easy and everyone accepts this. There's no problem there. If a woman smokes or drinks or takes certain medication and then they give birth to a child with some kind of disability, let's say without a limb. Everyone accepts that the woman is responsible. Everyone accepts that the destiny of the child has been shaped to some degree by the woman's actions. There, no one has a difficulty in accepting. And you see the woman every week, she goes to the midwife, the doctor, she takes folic acid and other medications. It's important for her because she knows, she acknowledges that she's shaping the destiny, albeit physical, in the physical domain of the child. And you never see women missing out on that. However, when it comes to the spiritual realm, here people have difficulties. Islam doesn't have a difficulty here. Islam is very straightforward. Islam has given the codes. But since people like me and you are drowned in the physical world, we don't understand these codes. And we don't accept them. How many parents do you see going to a spiritual doctor before conception? You don't see anyone. And then when the child has difficulties of a spiritual nature or mental or even bodily after birth, then they refer for doors and everything, but it's too late. In the same way that parents' actions can affect the child physically, there's no doubt, according to the logic of the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, the women's and husbands and all the previous great 
grandfathers, great grandfathers, grandmothers, their intentions, actions, behavior, all have a spiritual effect on the offspring too. And this is neglected. And this is important. Nesa'okum harthollakum. Your women are your cultivating land, if you like. Those nine months of gestation, something's going on there. It's important. For conception, okay, the male and the female have equal contribution there. But the nine months of gestation, the way the mother thinks, the way she behaves, the way she earns, what she eats, how she speaks, it's building the child. We'll come to traditions in a minute. What started as a unicellular embryo suddenly after nine months becomes four, three, three to four kilograms of mass. The, the, the newborn. Where, where is the newborn getting all this weight? The mother's flesh, her mother's own existence is granted to this newborn not only physically but the way she thinks her anxieties will have an effect her spirituality will have an effect her bodily constitution will have an effect one of the reasons why women can't have more than one husband is this because the woman who is a nurturer during the nine months of gestation how she thinks how she behaves how she intends is shaping this fetus now you imagine that she has two or three other husbands what's going to be the effect on that fetus there are some traditions that say that don't have intercourse in front of children it has a negative effect the child will enter vice the potential is there at least I'm not saying it's a definitive equation when the tradition says that don't do this action because this will happen it doesn't mean it's definitive it just means the potential is there the point is you're shaping the child that action in front of the child is not allowed it will have a bad effect on the, the child four years old, five years old, whatever let alone the fetus what effect that will have if the woman is occupied with more than one husband these are important reasons. Now in the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, there are many traditions that actually open this up. Some of the traditions are weak, some of the traditions are strong and sound. Overall there is tawatur in meaning. One has yaqeen that these things exist because of the increased number of these kind of, kinds of traditions. One tradition which I've chosen to read parts of because it's a very long tradition is a prescription that the Holy Messenger gave to Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam and Lady Fatima alayhi salam on their wedding night. And it's a very important tradition. A lot of codes, secrets of the cosmos are revealed here. And this is for two people who were ma'asum. But it applies to us too. But even for the ma'asumin, these codes were given. I'll just read some of the clauses of this very important tradition. Ya Ali. The Holy Messenger said, La tujamir imra'ataka 
في أول الشهر ووسطه وآخره Go oh, Ali, don't have intercourse with your wife at the start of the month, the middle of the month, the lunar month, the Islamic lunar month, and the end of the month. فَإِنَّ الْجُنُونَ وَالْجُذَامَ وَالْخَبَلْ يُسْرِعُ إِلَيْهَا وَإِلَى وَلَدِهَا because insanity, like a form of psychosis, leprosy or some form of skin disease, and dementia will be transmitted to the woman and to the offspring. See, that's not to say this will happen 100%, but the potential is there. The potential is there. In some traditions it says, don't do the act after dhuhr, in the afternoon, because it has an effect on the eyes, a physical effect on the eyes. The same tradition, Ya Ali, la tatakallam indal jama'ah, during that act, don't speak, it will have another negative effect. One by one, it's going through these codes. Don't see X part of the body during the act because this will happen. In an, another part of the tradition, Ya Ali, La Tujame Imraataka Bishahwate Imraate Gairik. Don't do the action with the with your wife after being excited via another woman. So, you became excited through another woman, then you approached your wife and you were occupied. These are important. I mean, one has to say these things on the member. There's nothing to be ashamed of. The words of the Imams, it's important. Let's get rid of the cultural taboos. I think we've had enough of those. Islam now. Taboo free. We want to learn Islam. So don't do that then. Being excited with another then going towards your wife and getting involved in the act. Fa'inni. Now he wants to give the reason why. I, the Holy Prophet is saying, Aksha, I fear. In Qudya Baina Kuma Walad. Because if an offspring, um, in this case, saying a male offspring, is procreated, is conceived, ayakuna muhannathan, muannathan, muhabbala, it'll be the male. Assalamualaikum. The male offspring, I fear will be effeminate, woman-like, and suffer some form of dementia. Muhabbala, I think that's the meaning. If someone can correct me there, I'm not sure, yes. In some, the same tradition, if you do the act without wudu, and the woman is pregnant, it speaks of the child potentially, I stress, becoming miserly. See? Here, the reason we don't accept these things is because we're so drowned in the physical world. We just, most of us just say, oh, forget it, I mean, this is all just fables and everything. That's your decision. My responsibility is to share these with you. The potential is there. Not only will you suffer as a result of only this, this act, the timing, how it's done. Not only will you lead to the suffering of a bodily nature to the child, but also mental and spiritual deficiencies can arise and you're responsible.
Now imagine the parents, the grandparents, the great grandparents, all of them, they all thought purely. They all behaved purely, generation after generation. So one's father, one's mother, one's father's mother and father, and their mother and father, and the, on the other side too. They thought purely. The ethics was pure. The way they spoke was pure. Everything was pure. They earned purely. They ate purely. They did all this. Here, the offspring will, of, will be of a bodily and spiritual constitution that is called Ismat. They become Masu. On birth, as a result of that purity and tapwa which continued for generations and generations, this is a product, a masum offspring procreated as a result of the preceding generations. That's the potential. That's what we mean by the prophets and the imams being born ma'asum. It's possible. I mean, medical science is going towards this direction, but it's going a bit slowly. It's still on the phase of what well, the bodily deficiencies that's now pro proven. The mental deficiencies are also proven. That if they're born in this environment, where it's very noisy, or if they mention a number of scenarios, the child will suffer. Now, this is all this data and evidence to prove this. But they haven't gone into the spiritual realm yet. Not with time, inshallah. The point is, the mother and father, all the preceding, everything was pure, taqwa. The offspring becomes pure, bodily wise, spiritually wise, and at birth, the status of Ismat is there. Not as a result of that child's doing, a result of the preceding generation's way of thinking, intending, and acting. Now, preserving that Ismat is more difficult than acquiring it. That, that is in relation to the child now. And as he grows, preserving that Ismat is much more difficult. These are two different phases. Being granted Ismat and then preserving that Ismat. And that's the rational justification of being born infallible. It's possible. In the traditions, in the texts, it's referred to this concept, Ashhadu an in ziyarat warith, Ashhadu annaka kunta nuran fil aslam al-shamikha wal arham al mutahara I bear testimony that you, O Imam, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, you were allied in the lofty wombs all your mothers, one after the other, mother, grandmother, all those, all lofty people, they thought purely, they acted purely. And this led a light until it came to your birth. The Arham al Mutahara, that's what it's referring to. The pure wombs. Aslob is referring to the lofty the sperm, father after father, generation after generation. These pure fathers that Imam Hussein had, they thought purely, acted purely. That sperm, the transmission from generation after generation, it led to this pure birth of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Lam tuna jiskal jahiliya ba'anjaseho. The era of ignorance didn't pollute you with its contaminations. It's a very important clause, this. If one understands this clause, one will understand why 
they couldn't have been a 13th Imam. It had to stop at the 12th. And that's why Qaybat had to occur. Occultation. The era of ignorance doesn't or didn't pollute you with its contaminations. The mothers, the fathers, all pure, one after the other. Sometimes you see children who maybe the father or mother aren't very practicing, but they become very religious because of what their grandmother, their grandfather, their great grandmother. Sometimes you see their good, the good actions of the previous generations not the direct parents, can have an effect on the offspring. The potential is there. Or, for example, with converts. Do you think it's easy to convert from Christianity, for example, to Islam? Do you think they convert at 16 or 20 or 25? They they did it all by themselves to convert. It's almost impossible to convert. Since we were born Muslims, we take it for granted. But to, a true conversion to Islam from another religion, it's almost impossible. It's very unlikely that it's only because of that convert that they managed to convert to Islam. That convert was Christian, for example. Their parents their grandparents, their great-grandparents. They, they were believers at the end of the day. They were still believers. They did good actions. Those good actions one day contributed to an offspring many generations down accepting Islam. And then when that convert accepts Islam, it'll be a day of joy and jubilation for those of his preceding generations who have passed away and are now in wherever they are they will receive heavenly provisions it's a day of joy it's, it's an honor for them that someone in some way many generations down they believed in Islam but all these it contributes to that it's not the convert alone it, it's possible but it's unlikely in any case, these actions from our parents up, 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 upwards, it has an effect. The potential is there. It can be a good effect, it can be a bad effect. However, sometimes some sins are worse than others in relation to how it has an effect on the offspring. One of those sins, which have a more of a negative effect compared to other sins, in relation to the development of the offspring, is when the offspring, when the child is born out of wedlock. Here, this, this becomes a bit of a problem. In relation to the child, him or herself, there's no bias in Islam in relation to that child. That child, like me and you, also has the potential to acquire spiritual perfection. The, the door is still open. It's not as if it's closed. No. That child can do all the things that we can do, we can marry and everything. There's no social bias. In some cultures, there is a bias, but not in Islam. However, there is something that Islam had to do in such cases. And it's not because of the child, him or herself. It's because of this significant potential threat that the parents who are responsible for it, they did. Nothing to do with the child. But at the end of the day, it happened. Some things you can't deny. They had medication, now the child has no limb. Let's say 